thanks a lot. Thanks uh, especially to Dan for making this possible. I think that this visor is uh, a very good thing and um, I come out very good and suggest people continue to do so as well. Uh, so I've got, a, I've got a paper here and I've got a sort of preamble and I've got various preambles and preamble. So I've got to, not to take too much time uh, with, with all that. Uh, I guess, okay, so one, the question is why Mexico? And I guess truth be told, I don't really consider myself a Mexicanist, a specialist on, on Mexico. I sort of do a bit of everything when it comes to Latin America, Latin American studies. And uh, up until recently, I sort of, when people ask me what do I do more specifically, I'd say anything except for Brazil and Mexico. But um, it, it seems to me that Mexico is important. And I guess I'm going to, this paper, so increasingly I've been trying to think about Mexico and what's going on in Mexico at the moment, specifically the violence, uh, the war on by with drugs or whatever, the drug war. Uh, it, it seems to be something that uh, it is important to try and think about. Uh, I, I should say, a couple of people in the last couple of minutes ago were saying things like, oh, we're going to be talking about Deleuze. I'm not, um, and, and in fact, there's, there's not, as much, not as much theory here as some people may want. Although I suppose what, what to me is the important, one of the important things about Mexico, one of the challenges about Mexico is the way it sort of challenges our theoretical apparatuses. So what I feel I'm still sort of struggling with is thinking about ways in which to think. Right? What, what, what tools are, what, what tools there may be for understanding what's going on there. And, and I'll talk in a minute about how it seems to, the, the notion of exception does a, a number of different tasks, uh, one of which is indicating the notion of the state of exception, right? Uh, which people like Agamben have made popular, I suppose, as a concept, but it's also the notion that the Mexico doesn't quite fit, right? Within the ways in which we think about what's going on, especially the, I suppose, the ways in which uh, we Latin Americans, people who think about Latin America, trying to think about what, what goes on. So uh, uh, it's, a, yeah, it's a challenge to theory rather than a, an explicitly theoretical piece here. Though, if you want to lose, I suppose this could be thought of as a sort of meditation on the last line of Thousand Plateau, which I think is uh, something like never assume a, a smooth space is enough to save us. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, uh, so I'm, but I'm, I'm, I guess I'm more concerned with questions of representation. How to represent, how, how to think about the things that are going on there. Then I'd also like to say is that this is going to be a bit of a downer. So, you know, for those of us, and I'm sometimes like this, I'm, I gave a talk in DC the other day and I felt I had to apologize uh, for being wildly optimistic. Uh, you know, we all like to find, you know, resistant, subversive, triumphantly transgressive social actors of one sort or another. And um, they may be hiding somewhere in Mexico, but I haven't found them. And uh, I guess this, this is clearly a, a work in progress as, as such things are, so I'm all more interested to hear uh, what you might have to say in the discussion that might uh, arise. And, and then my sort of final preamble to the preamble is that I can't really talk or think about Mexico without thinking also about a woman called Jimena Oseguena, who was a graduate student in my department, French Hispanic and Italian Studies at the UBC, and who almost two years ago uh, disappeared uh, from the place that she was living, uh, Batulco, in, in, uh, in, in the southwest of, of Mexico. <coughs> Place which is a, a tourist destination. My mother in law went on a cruise, for instance. You know, this is a, supposedly a safe part of Mexico, but uh, two weeks later, uh, her body and that of the person she was with uh, was found in a shallow grave on, on the beach. Uh, perhaps the most horrific thing about that is also that the first person who, who found her, who, uh, Camino, I think, who, who went down 
police were nowhere near. He was told to go to this beach and, <coughs> and dig. He went to the beach and, and dug and he found the body and he didn't sort of they reported it immediately and, and it wasn't hers. And the next day he went back. So there were you know, there were more bodies there. Um, so uh, so, so the first of the preamble is the preamble. Uh, the preamble itself is a, a sort of a brief, a very brief history of violence in Latin America, um, which itself is a kind of reference to the text, the very brief account of the destruction of the, of the Indies, which is a good place then to start by Tolomé de las Casas' account of the initial conquest, the effects of the initial conquest. Uh, which were essentially mass uh, extermination. Uh, so violence is, is rooted in uh, the history and experience and <coughs> memory uh, of, of Latin America from, from the outset. Uh, uh, a violence which is associated with uh, the process of primitive accumulation, uh, the search for gold <coughs> and silver in, in the first instance, and then a whole series of other resources for extraction and usually refining elsewhere, uh, guano, rubber, coffee, tea, no, sort of coffee, sugar, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, and and uh, this uh, violence of principal accumulation uh, associated also with the violence of the imposition of the social contract. Uh, so in Las Casas, Las Casas talks about a, a document, a document which um, was drawn up in, in Spain as a sort of legal justification for conquest called the requirement or, or the requerimiento, uh, which was uh, supposed to be read to the indigenous people given the choice of either you agree with this, there's a sort of brief sort of theological history of the world, sort of starting with Adam and Eve, going down to the Spanish king and queen, king and queen in Castile, uh, and then justifying the rights to the, these lands and so on. Although the, the, this document was was often not read it was in the earshot of the indigenous who, even if it, they had been present, uh, would have understood the Spanish and so on and so forth. So this is sort of a pretext, a, a transparent sort of ally, I suppose, uh, for, for conquest and for accumulation. But this fiction of a, of a, of a social contract, right, that there's some kind of agree, agreement as, as a, a family principle, uh, which soon becomes very transparently uh, not so. And it soon becomes obvious uh, that the violence is at the nexus of this attempt to establish uh, economic and, and political uh, capital. Uh, I also point out to the fact, and of course this continues to the day with, with you know, mining and resource extraction, which is now, especially Canadian mining corporations, and their role in places like uh, Barrick in, in Argentina, and Goldberg in, in Guatemala, and so on. I went to a I went to a conference a year or so ago, put on by some sort of fancy people in, in, in here in Vancouver, and there are various representatives of the mining corporations there, <laughs> and um, uh, they all sort of had the lingo, you know, about uh, social license to uh, to proceed or whatever it is, and so on and so forth. Uh, but they seemed utterly oblivious to the to the sort of historical dimension, that, that they were just, uh, for, for most people in Latin America, they were just the latest uh, had to arrive at their, their dreams of quick wealth, or relatively quick wealth, through resource extraction. Uh, I'd also like to say, because I think this is important, and uh, in developing this paper, when I develop it further, it's something I want to do more with, uh, there's also <coughs> an, uh, an exploitation and reinstitution of affect uh, in the history of, of Latin America. Uh, an international trade, in the first instance, in stimulants and intoxicants, so the importance of sugar, for instance, and, and, and coffee, uh, for, uh, as like like Sidney Mintz's argument in, in Sweden's and Paris, and uh, that's what, the way in which uh, sugar from the colonies uh, enables the sort of pacification and uh, and uh, uh, increased productivity of the working classes in places like England mm -hmm. uh, as they should have been and so on and so forth. Um, the sort of interconnection of, of the ways in which stimulation and intoxication uh, are, are also part of this history of uh, accumulation and redistribution, uh, which now we see in terms of coca 
and, and so on, and marijuana, and so on and so forth. Uh, also, I have an exploitation and redistribution of affect uh, from uh, sort of the, the sort of exotic instruction which becomes legitimized in literary criticism in terms of magical realism, for instance, or the Carmen Miranda films, the Good Neighbor Policy uh, movies of the, of the 1940s, uh, for instance, when Carmen Miranda was the single best paid person in Hollywood. In which I think that was part of what she, what she was offering. But there's something again about this, uh, yeah, this Latin spirit, right, which is being also mined at the same time with these more, at least these more obvious, I suppose, material uh, processes of uh, extraction and accumulation. Uh, then, uh, uh, sort of zipping to the 20th century, just point to two moments before going on to talk about Mexico. Uh, the first is, I guess, the moment of terror and neoliberalism, uh, which is the moment of the dirty wars, the lost decade uh, in Latin America of the know, 1970s and 1980s, uh, the point at which, especially after coups in Brazil in, in the 1960s, in late 1964, in Chile in 1973, in Argentina, uh, added to the fact that uh, places like Paraguay had been under military rule since essentially since Paraguay was invented, um, and uh, the military regimes in Central America, South Carolina, Guatemala, and so on. Uh, this is the moment in which uh, the question of, of violence and representation uh, becomes, uh, comes to the fore, uh, especially around the question of disappearance, right? how, how, to, how to think about and, and represent uh, uh, disappearance, uh, which became a tactic for many of these regimes, perhaps the whole Guatemalan regime, but perhaps most sort of notably or, or most famously in, in places like Argentina and, and, and Chile. Uh, it's also a point at which it was a, a assumed that which I guess violence is associated uh, indelibly with the state. <coughs> yet this this notion of civil society against the against the state. Um, and, and various forms of Solidarity, um, international solidarity with civil society variously conceived uh, from the numbers who disappeared, say in, in Argentina, uh, to I don't know, the Sandinistas, um, <coughs> and then the, the complicated issue, of course, because they actually won the revolution and the FMLN in, in El Salvador. Uh, by the early 1990s, uh, almost all of those. Uh, dictatorships or military regimes um, were out of power in different circumstances, in different ways, uh, in, in the various, uh, in, in different cases, whether um, uh, because of sort of national humiliation in the case of uh, Argentina, uh, whether it's a much more managed transition, for instance, in, in Chile, or um, different forms of social protest that uh, enable transitions in, in other places. Um, and, and for a moment at least, that seemed the moment of, of triumph, I suppose, until I guess it was, it was realized uh, that this transition was also a transition from uh, the state logic uh, to the logic of the, of the market, that the, the, the military regimes had, in, in most cases enabled that, with the thesis which named the climate so the shock doctrine, for instance. Uh, then there's uh, another moment, which is, I guess, um, the moment of the left turns, uh, which follows on, uh, which we can trace back to the Caracas in 1989, the social rebellion in Caracas in, in Venezuela, uh, against uh, neoliberal reforms uh, introduced by then President Carlos Andre Perez. Venezuela, which actually hadn't been, which had been, seemed to be exceptional in its own way, because it didn't have a military regime. Um, but it, which initiates this uh, new wave of leftists, or supposedly leftist uh, uh, governments and uh, presidents in places like Bolivia, Ecuador, Brazil, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but which will also represent, I think, uh, the last gasp of the social contract. And I think that's what people like Chavez and, and uh, uh, were up to, for instance. Uh, in, the f in the face of the fact that the Creole Republic could no longer uh, was under such, was under, put under crisis essentially, um, uh, 
people like Lula and, and, uh, and Chavez, but also called Korea, um, uh, are brought in, and uh, despite the controversy around Chavez, he's essentially the Venezuelan middle class respect for he, he prevents another Caracas or that passage. So, um, we got these sort of two, this, this broad narrative of violence and, and uh, the primitive accumulation. We got these two more recent narratives about the transition from state violence to uh, market neoliberalism and uh, the opening, possible opening to new forms of political experimentation, which have enabled something like a, a laboratory Latin America, right? Because I don't think that I know, Bolivia and Ecuador and, and Argentina say uh, are doing the same things, even though there's a sort of loose uh, alliance between them. Uh, a whole series of experimentations uh, in, in, in yeah, political forms and political processes and the question of what uh, democracy, for instance, is about, enabled by the fact that, of course, the United States is looking the other way. Right? Mm -hmm. The United States that is a potential uh, uh, fix in uh, Iraq, Central Asia, and so on and so forth. And then there's Mexico. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Really, my film was took a little bit more time than I thought. Um, I, I have a little, this, this paper starts with a brief history of counterinsurgency and low intensity uh, warfare. I essentially I'm suggesting um, the, a move from low intensity warfare to what I'm calling low intensity peace. Um, the, the history of, of, of counterinsurgency starts probably in Malaya, in the, in the post war and malaria emergency of the late 1940s. So it gets picked up um, by the 1960s, probably in, in Latin America, and, and it becomes a sort of manual for dealing with, with social unrest, I suppose. And the US field manual on low intensity conflict uh, defines it as follows a political military confrontation between contending states or groups below conventional war and above the routine peaceful competition among states. It frequently involves protracted struggles and competing principles and ideologies. Low intensity conflict ranges from subversion to use of armed force, where by a combination of means employing political, economic, informational, and military instruments. Low intensity conflicts are often localized generally in the third world, but contain regional and global security implications. So low intensity conflict blurs a series of demarcations that had hitherto been so important for the understanding and experience of war. It fuses, for instance, the political and the military, rather than in class with its famous dictum, war being the continuation of policy by other means, policy is now one of the arms employed as an integral part of war and winning hearts and minds and so on. If anything, this is an inversion of classes. Policy becomes the continuation of war by other means. In practice, however, there's constant oscillation or irregular and unpredictable shifts between the two. And then second, when the manual terms political, economic, informational, and military instruments were employed at particular points in specific circumstances according to a complex calculation of opportunity and risk. So some of that sort of heterogeneity of um, low intensity uh, warfare. And then there is no mass mobilization on either side except in exceptional circumstances, the general offensive, the military surge, for instance. The routines of everyday life are so far as possible to be maintained. And then fourth, Mimicking this pattern, these patterns of flexibility from maneuverability, of sudden and surprising engagement and equally abrupt disengagement employed by the guerrilla forces against which they are arrayed, state and or international forces likewise adapt to the terrain and bide their time when necessary. So, so we get a new sense of spatiality and temporality, for instance, in, in which uh, they have war and peace and, and, and uh, occupied and unoccupied zones, safe zones. And, and war zones become uh, endlessly blurred and endlessly uh, flexible or moving. Mm -hmm. In uh, Edward Lovebeck's famous analysis of the difference between conventional and low intensity warfare, he says in the former, the terrain only counts insofar as it presents obstacles to transportation, deployment, and the efficient application of firepower. And as for the enemy, it is merely a set of targets which must be designated, located, and sometimes induced to concentrate. In the latter, uh, i.e., in low intensity warfare, Victory is to be obtained by identifying the specific weaknesses of a particular enemy and then reconfiguring one's own capabilities to exploit those, to exploit those weaknesses. The sort of immunitization of, of, of violence. 
In, in low intensity conflict, a social and spatial hermeneutics comes to the fore, as well as an appreciation of specificity and singularity. So, again, it's sort of linked to, um, I guess, again, the theoretical references here, implicit rather than explicit, but the, the ways in which uh, uh, Foucault, for instance, talked about society and uh, about control, about the discipline. The keys to success, this is Lovelace still, uh, first the ability to interpret the external environment in all its aspects, subtle as well as obvious, and then to adapt one's own organizational formats, operational methods and tactics to suit the requirements of the, of the particular situation. So against the homogenizing impulse of the nation state and its strategic or socioeconomic abstraction and denial of difference, the low intensity conflict that is most sophisticated at least, values precision over brute force. The state tends to become imminent, it tries to undo forces whose prime resource is precisely their ability to blend into the background, to go underground, to use clandestinity, even the clandestinity of hiding in plain sight, to their advantage. Uh, I'm going to skip a little so that we have, uh, uh, have time. So, don't worry about time, I'll be fine. <laughs> I choose to worry about time. <laughs> Blurring any line between state and society, 
El Salvador resonates with low-level anxiety and fear. Even the death squads for which the country was so notorious in the 1980s uh, seem to have re-emerged, albeit transformed, and I'm quoting, from groups seeking to silence political opposition to ones effectuating social cleansing or carrying out contract killings. Despite this shift away from an overtly political logic, however, death squads have engaged in social cleansing involved many of the individual and institutional actors linked to death squads during the Civil War. And yet, nobody notices El Salvador is, after all, at peace. But what of, and here I move to uh, Mexico, what of what, what, what is surely the most shocking of all peaceful societies in the Americas? Mexico, uh, a country that has not officially been at war, apart from it sort of ritually declared war on the Axis in 1942, but none has not officially been at war since uh, the revolution in uh, 1911. The Mexican have, have reason to be wary of uh, peace treaties. Uh, they did have to lose over half their territory in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo uh, to end the Mexican American War in 1848, but they have perhaps still more reason to be wary of peace. Since 2006, it is estimated that some 50 to 70,000 people have been killed in the country's drug related violence. To put this in context, the number killed and or disappeared in Pinochet and Chile is reckoned to be around 3,000. Argentina's dirty war left around 30,000 dead. In El Salvador, the civil war claimed uh, 70 to 80,000, and it was more or less, over a period of 10 years, uh, the same amount uh, that have been killed in Mexico in the last six or seven years. Uh, at present rates, Mexico will fairly quickly overtake even Guatemala's unenviable record. 150 to 200,000 dead, which in Guatemala's, case, in Guatemala's case took place over a 45 year period. All this in a country that is notionally at peace, the democracy's economy is tightly linked into that of the United States, and there remains a favorite vacation uh, spot from Cancun to Puerto Vallarta of millions of Americans, Canadians, and others every year. Mexico and Mexican exception suggests an anti political specter at the margins, was at the very center of laboratory Latin America. It might be better to describe this as a politics of death, a, pol a politics fully inscribed within the death drive. For there is something political about it too. And of all the possible enemies of contemporary de democratic experimentation, there are many, um, and this is the worst. Frankly, I myself have something of a loss of words to have to describe it. I'm far from alone in this, but I think any discussion of politics in the present must consider what's going on in Mexico. Now, violence, drug trafficking, and corruption have their own long traditions in the country. The most famous instance of the state's desire to oppress protest and discontent came in 1968, and the culmination of the general student mobilization backed by uh, the unions, <coughs> Mexico's version of the wave of activism, that also rocked Paris and Berlin and Milan, and it made 1968 a high point of idealistic attempts to rethink and remake political community. In Mexico City, however, the protests have wiped out a particular um, more bloodily and, and cruelly than elsewhere. On the eve of the Olympic Games, I think 10 days before the Games were about to start uh, in Mexico City, the authorities were worried, amongst other things, about the image of the country presented to the world, embroiled in social unrest and political antagonism. So during the afternoon and the night of October 2, 1968, security forces, including snipers, Fire and Max gathering high school and university students concentrated in the plaza of the three cultures in the district of Plata Loco in the north of Mexico City. Precise details of the event were soon covered up and are still subject to some controversy. Estimates vary as the final toll of the massacre from around 30 to more likely around 700, 300 or so. But beyond the death of individuals, Plata Loco also spelled the death now for the dream of the Mexican nation state. The hegemonic unity. In Ryan Wong's words, I quote, the incorporative aspirations of the post revolutionary state were revealed to our brutally exclusive foundations. What followed was then a profound crisis of national popular ideology. In a sense, from that moment on, Mexico was a nation in name only, a society held together by the long tentacles of the state bureaucracy that drew on historic patterns of clientelism and Calvinism by which I mean the power of local strongmen, nodes and webs of patronage that permeate village and towns and come together in close connection with the ruling party 
partido revolucionario institucional, institución revolucionaria, parte del PRI, del BIN en PAL a decades, y se dice que se revolución. En este contexto de patronage y institucional longevity, corrupción thrived. State power was organized and distributed in myriad exchanges of favors and kickbacks. Naturally enough, these were also propitious circumstances for the rise of organized drug trade, but both of local product, such as marijuana and to some extent, to some extent heroin, as well as increasingly on Mexico's geographical position as conduit between cocoa growing regions of South America, Colombia above all, and the growing market for cocaine and their crack in the United States in the 1970s and 1980s. But for many years, the relationship between the drug trade and the state was a cozy one, even relatively uncomplicated. But as the pre's hold on power gradually weakened, eventually leading to the loss of the presidency for the first time in 90 years, with the election of Vicente Fox in 2000, and as the drug cartels gained influence and power of their own, sufficient to match or even outmatch the state, particularly in the provinces far from the capital, that relationship deteriorated. Or rather, as evidence increasingly suggests, the state was for the first time forced to take sides, as it could no longer simply stand over the ever growing rivalries between fragments of what was yet ever bigger and better our business. So Fox uh, sent in the army to confront the cartels in Nuevo Laredo and, and Tamaulipas. Several thousand people died in the early thousands. Uh, but the violence re really escalated under the subsequent president, Felipe Calderon who from 2006 sent more troops out and cemented the notion the country was now under a state of siege. In the words of two of the more prominent bloggers covering the violence, I'll talk a little later why bloggers are mostly covering the violence, uh, Calderon and a quote ran around our country and began hitting the beehive, thinking it would get rid of the bees, however when that happens the bees don't die, the bees attack. In the mid 2000s, the numbers of deaths frequently doubled on an annual basis. So, from 2000 or so fatalities in 2006, for instance, to over 5,000 in 2007, something like 11,000 in 2010. <coughs> the entire effort has been almost spectacularly counterproductive at best. Three years in Calderon's reign, for example, estimated Mexican heroin production climbed from 8 metric tons to 50 metric tons. What's, uh, one of the things that's interesting and problematic to me is the silence of what is effectively something like a genocide. This comes not only from the fact that there are no formal or even informal hostilities in the country, but also because the press is among the many institutions corrupted and or silenced by this violence. Into this vacuum step social media, to some extent Twitter, especially blogs, among the few to document this extraordinary human and social toll. Indeed, beyond the shocking total of fatalities, the way in which such swathes of the country are washed in blood and fear, what is perhaps most striking is the refusal of all representation. Sometimes the old media disappear because they're forced to do so, and new cultural forms take their place simply because otherwise there would be nothing at all. There's, uh, however, what I'm suggesting we can't simply dismiss this or ignore this as apparent, as apparent horror. As the US Secretary of State, Henry Clinton herself, refer to the drug fueled drug violence there as an insurgency. I think we should take that seriously. I don't think it is an insurgency, but uh, I'm trying to suggest that we should think about the, the politics or, or how it makes us rethink uh, our politics. It would be useless to buy a sense of politics, a theory of politics. It would be useless to bracket it off as a criminality. The flowering of alternative networks around the illicit drug trade has everything to do with the weakness and distribution of the Mexican state, the failures of his claims to social representation. There is also clearly something multitudinous, something constituent about the various rival gangs and their extensive, expansive transnational organizations, dedicated to clearing a smooth space. That's it, to look. <laughs> 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 for the better dispersal of capital and commodities. <coughs> this is the case just as equally clearly with their rival hierarchies and the assumption of new forms of sovereignty as drug, drug leaders uh, claim a state of permanent exception for themselves, in part by intimidation, in part by suborning both local and national authorities. Is this the future of capitalism itself? A post-national, but also post-state capitalism is savage indeed. 
Again, however, all this passes almost immediately completely in silence. For objects of the drug traffickers' threat is not simply the state, it's also the traditional media. Journalists have been kidnapped and killed. It's the most dangerous country on earth, I think, to be a, a journalist. Uh, newspapers have been threatened in silence. Notably, and one notable moment was when in Ciudad Juarez, on, on the border of the United States, the city's largest newspaper published a front-page editorial directed straight at organized crime. But this was not for the purpose of analysis, critique, or condemnation. Rather, it was, it was a plea. It said, we need you to explain to us what you want us to publish and what not. For in some ways, the narcos too want the bloodshed documented and are conscious of some kind of audience for their gruesome work. For instance, the cartels fairly routinely address the citizens of the towns or regions in which they're operating. These so-called narco messages are sometimes distributed to the suppliers on the street, <coughs> but they also often uh, get the local press to print them. Often they're all the press can print. Uh, they're strange texts, and one of the things I want to do at well, some point is think more and read more of, uh, of, these, of these texts. Uh, they, they often imply some kind of justification for the violence, but without ever seeking endorsement or legitimation, without right? ever attempting some kind of popular appeal. So, so one, for instance, from the Union of Cartels, uh, a federation of gangs that came together in opposition to the Zetas, the Fisk and Zetas, declared in March 2010, a message to the people, don't worry and don't be paranoid. This will soon be over. It is a readjustment. Soon the extortions, the kidnappings, the pain, and the Jews will end. There will be, there will be peace without the Zetas, who will live without, without fear. It is as though the narcos, in their own way, are conscious of the logical theory of exception. The most striking is the extent to which their discourse parallels that of the state itself. It is in part like Gareth Williams, for instance, can argue that there is no ideological conflict between sovereigns or real enemies in the Mexican drug war. And the explicit ideology of the enemy is the explicit ideology of the friend and vice versa. It is in this sense a war in which the enemies are in fact brothers in arms, brother, friend, and enemy. So Williams further suggests that the war on drugs is a conflict that is internal to capital. And though it clearly highlights the exceptional exercise of the force of war without war, there is, he suggests, no politics in the war on drugs. And indeed, the Times and Apple message seems to confirm this notion. Well, this is not politics, as we understand. I mean, he's obviously alluded to Schmidt there, for instance. Uh, uh, but, but there's no politics in the sense of hegemonic or counter hegemonic or para hegemonic or something, uh, uh, politics. Um, in its refusal to even try to interpolate any kind of citizen or popular subjectivity, the narco simply asked for space to continue their rampage. This is from the same narco message. People of Reynosa, that there's sort of messages to various people, right? So there's like, people of Reynosa, do not send your children to school. Avoid leaving your house if it's not important until further notice. You know what is happening on the streets. Indeed, on some level, and despite both the press silence and the intricacies of various alliances and confrontations, temporary or otherwise, between cartels or between narcos and state, the give rise to a whole array of conspiracy theories, which are probably quite correct, the fact that the conspiracy theories doesn't necessarily legitimate them. And despite the, the intricacies of trying to trace who's who and people die and people are replaced and so on and so forth amongst the leadership, in the end, everybody does know what is going on. The brute fact of death and dismemberment hardly needs much interpretation or elaboration. Hence, also perhaps the silence. What indeed can be said? Meanwhile, organized crime also arranges ever more bloody spectacles of local intimidation. I had thought, I, I sort of wavered, I, I dilly dally um, over whether I should project some images. Um, and then I thought, there's a sort of pornography of these uh, dismembered uh, uh, bodies. I think I can do it and just sort of make it out of focus or something, but I wasn't quite sure. So I haven't. Uh, but there are these, these spectacles of violence, often quite elaborate, involving different forms of decapitation and dismemberment. Dismembered heads, for instance, on the top of cars that contain within them decapitated corpses, for instance. These mute signs or signs to compel muteness are collected and distributed throughout the internet. Otherwise, there'd be nothing to see at all. And recently, I think there was a bit of a uh, kerfluffle uh, on Facebook about a video of a woman who was 
Oh, being a cop taker on Facebook, likewise, I'm not sure we it over sure. Should we, should we uh, allow us to be seen, to be, to be uh, published, certainly? In the middle of this vacuum, caused by violence and intimidation, I say the bloggers and the tweeters have taken up their role, the, the, the media's role of performing the otherwise unheralded effect of the region's violence. So recently, for instance, a, a book's been published, this, uh, this one, uh, collecting postings and photographs from El Blog del Narco, the Narco blog, probably the most famous important of the blogs that cover the phenomenon of drug terror. The book is full of grisly, usually full-color photographs of corpses and crime scenes, and richly deserves the warning that comes with it, not suitable for minors. Of course, on the streets of Chihuahuas and Aloha, there are no such signs, the bodies themselves serve as warnings, allow for no discrimination of age or legal status. It is notable then and gruesome enough that the bodies left on the streets and squares of northern and western Mexico and elsewhere increasingly are intended to be read and seen, seen and read by others. I say sometimes this is apparent through the, the remarkably sort of excessively uh, uh, sort of complex uh, forms of mutilation that the corpses have undergone. Which includes sometimes the set physical characteristics or the mark of the body of the Z, for instance. Uh, Decapitation is common. Uh, uh, body parts are arranged as signs or signals, warnings or portents. And then to drive the point home, they're often accompanied with homemade placards, which are called uh, narco bandits, narco bandits, that express quite specific threats. But like the activities of long intensity warfare, uh, these messages are meant, I think, to be local indications, read in particular circumstances and places, rather than broadcast nationally, let alone internationally. Hence the aggression against the press and indeed against the blog del narco. And this understandably anonymous writer has tell us, I'm quoting, shortly before we completed this book, two people, a young man and woman who worked with us, were disemboweled and hung up a bridge in Tamaulipas. Large handwritten signs, these narco letters next to their bodies mentioned our blog and stated that this was what happened to internet snitches. The message concluded with a warning that we were next. A few days later, they executed another journalist in Tamaulipas who regularly sent us information. The assassins left keyboards and maps, so again, the sort of legibility of the, of the fragments, strewn and another computer parts, strewn across her body, as well as a sign that mentioned our blog again. And in their book, they conclude, a whole new generation of Mexico's future has been bathed in blood. Tens of thousands of children in small towns and big cities are living side by side with incredible violence. Despite the destruction of our homes and culture, one positive effect of these events is the disparate effect the elements of Mexican society are coming together. Then you battle cry, if the authorities won't protect us, then together we will protect ourselves. But there's no sense here of a return to the illusion of state protection. An answer to post-state problems must itself be post status Uh, drugs violence, especially on the scale that we're seeing it in parts of Mexico, is creating and also arising from a new subalternity or a new subalternization. And, and there have been various attempts to think about and deal with the related femicide that likewise plagues, especially in the border regions and also parts of Central America, such as uh, Guatemala. But again, I think for the moment it's simply the inadequacy of any strategy of representation that's most striking. Despite the sort of optimistic note at the, at the end of the Rob Del Nago book, for instance, it really is not clear to me how a more positive constituent moment can be elicited from such a situation. So, in the end, I'm not sure there's anything particularly to celebrate in laboratory Latin America when we include uh, Mexico. But still, it is here at the interface of a new culture and a new politics in a social abstract machine or shared cultural genre that drives both so we're going to understand what is distinctive about this new morphology of power <coughs> and where it's going to be found. But none of this is solely or even particularly a Mexican problem, however much the Mexicans bear the brunt of the violence. This is the brutality of the rampant capitalism of a savage free market which rival groups compete with the immense profits reaped from overseeing the flows of commodities and cash and weapons uh, up from Central and South America to the USA and back down. The crisis of Mexico is also a crisis of the nation-state and an entire nation-state system 
now that national governments can no longer even pretend to maintain a monopoly of legitimate violence within their own territory. It's a crisis of sovereignty undone by ruthless entrepreneurship, coordinated violence, and untamed appetite that combine to further erode all boundaries and borders between nations, between state and society, between competent and civilian, between targeted and collateral damage, between war and peace. This is the low intensity peace that is our global reality whose leading edges usually, if not always, expel to the margins, but it's in which we were all implicated in one way or another. Okay, this is my last uh, paragraph, but I pretend to be theoretical. After all, for George Ogamba, the exception is now the norm. We're all subject to the biophysical imperative that regulates our everyday life, from the ubiquity of airport style security, the kinds of scandals and unbridled cynicism about electoral democracy that uh, feature in the Canadian Senate right now. There's perhaps in places like Mexico, if also Honduras, Iraq, Afghanistan, and so on, that we see their life most fully on display, red in tooth and claw, as all the norms of legality and legitimacy are suspended indefinitely by both parties to what is an increasingly bloody dispute without obvious end, other than the interminable pursuit of profit, unwittingly exposing the violence that subtends the conjoint history of capitalism and politics. The violence is the living legacy from the initial conquest to our post colonial present. Yet it is hard to ascribe to a gambling's admittedly cautious and somewhat known conclusion that, this is a conclusion to his book, The Little Book of the State of Exception, uh, that the only truly political action is that which severs the nexus between violence and law. Surely it is precisely such a severance that we see in the activities of Mexico's drug cartels. A pursuit of profit and capital accumulation that entirely shrugs off the norms of any possible legal framework. We do not see in any gesture, any gesture of recompense, some kind of what a government calls pure law, a word that does not bind, and neither commands nor prohibits anything, but says only itself. What we may see, and here I try a little bit optimistic, is the slow growth of new habits, new ways of inhabiting the desert of absolute violence and the state of exception revealed. Everyday life does, after all, as the contributors, the authors of the book, on the suggest, uh, it, it does all, after all, continue, continue despite everything. But ultimately, all we have are our habits. And it may be that at some point, the multitude will turn on the cartels and the state alike, rejecting capital and the pretense of the social contract. But that end is not easily in sight. Announcements. Um, first of all, uh, after our salubrious conversation, we can go on as long as it needs to. Uh, we're going to head to the Metropole Pub for some drinks with John and uh, 355 Packets. Please uh, accompany us on that endeavor. Um, really cheap drinks over there, and it's a hospitable venue. Um, also, uh, next week, um, it's going to be Remembrance Day next Monday, I think. Um, we're not going to be particularly acknowledging it. Um, not out of any kind of disrespect, uh, just because I don't think my grandpa would want me to sit at home and twiddle my thumbs on Remembrance Day. Um, we're going to be uh, welcoming Bo Earl from UBC's English department, um, who's a really brilliant guy. And he's going to be interrogating our understanding of freedom um, through Hegel and Benjamin. Uh, I've uploaded the readings to our WordPress site. It's going to be a great talk. Um, also, as you leave um, later on, what's that? I uploaded the readings. Yeah. The readings aren't loaded at all. <laughs> Wait, so then they're more loaded than my readings. <laughs> <laughs> Debatable. Um, as you leave, um, the books on um, the other section of the gallery are not free. Uh, they're for sale. And uh, Kate's uh, manning the table over there. So if you want to buy any art books, um, you're welcome to do so. Um, so um, Q&A. Uh, the crime scenes that they were talking about remind me of Paul Long's work. I mean, he did some work here called Murder Research in the 70s. Have you heard of that work? Uh, I haven't. I took photographs on the industry of this huge crime scene. That reminds me of that. Hi, I hear your pessimism of finding a solution in Mexico to the really legal or political system that's given the cartel's influence at so many different levels. Do you see any possible solution through 
economic differences, like decriminalization of drugs in the U.S., the prime market, would that have any impact that you, that you see? Um, I mean, I'm in favor of decriminalization, right? I don't think it's a bad thing. Uh, uh, but I don't think it gets to what I'm trying to talk about or think about here, right? So, uh, I mean, I guess a different, different way that I want to think about decriminalization, and one is sort of let the market, and both, 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 both ways are problematic. One is sort of let the market decide, you know? Um, but this is precisely the problem, right? You know, this, this is one of, the, one of the forces here that I'm kind of suggesting. Right? This, is, this, is, this is what happens, you know? This is part of what happens. So it's right? uh, when markets get their way, or you can think about sort of regulated decriminalization, like in fact, they just did in uh, Uruguay, right? In, in which the, the state becomes the uh, sort of legislator or, or something like that. Uh, but again, I think, and I'm not particularly against that as a pragmatic measure, um, but what's at stake here, I think, or what I was trying to suggest is. My on the one hand, also the state and, uh, and, and the ex exclusionary violence that it's found upon. So it's a kind of you know pragmatic, pragmatic, palliative, and just sort of rational, you know, like means to proceed. Then absolutely. But uh, I, what's interesting to me, one of the things that's uh, interesting but also disturbing and, and shocking, it is what the situation in Mexico tells us about both state and market. Um, well, the, the thing that I got the most, apart from a lot of anxiety about uh, kind of a, um, reviewing all this information, I'm Mexican, right? And, and it's, it's with a lot of anxiety that I'm hearing this because it's something that I have been following since I moved here, which was 2000, exactly. And uh, what I got from your talk about, apart from my anxiety, is this uh, death drive, right? I was thinking how um, this problem is, is so, so complex and in so many layers, and uh, how uh, the government is perverse, <laughs> completely uh, disregarding any sort of law. There, there has been, um, like in several occasions, uh, the, the, how do you say, the elections were completely dismissed, completely disavowed, not respected, right, since um, a Cardenas and then recently. So uh, there's a, a really perverse kind of system in, this, in the government. But then we have the other problem of, of the uh, narco-traffic that has been growing up and being very different as before it, it was more bonded by certain values of family as any mafia, any good decent mafia. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but nowadays that those uh, links of blood and lineage are not there. It's, it's just like the rampage of the neoliberalism, right? Like the capitalism in the savage uh, side, right? Like there's no bonding uh, of certain uh, law or respect that it used to be, right? So it's kind of the co collision of two very perverse systems that, that for me, I mean, thinking um, about Mexico, my only hope is seeing the people that think and, and do things every day, right? The artists, the people that, that keep doing something in spite, because I, I get the same feeling when I go to Mexico or talk to my friends, and I'm like completely pessimist and, and like horrified about the situation. And yet I hear people that, that are still in that resistance because, well, Mexico is a great country in, in many ways. But, but yeah, it has this awful shed around, right? That, and I was thinking how the art uh, scene is so hip nowadays or so important. Mexico City is a big scene for the arts. And I, I wonder if through that sort of um, representation through the arts, and we talked a little bit about that when you were paneling that um, visit of the 
uh, remember the, the writers that came from Mexico, that we were talking a little bit whether or not through the possibility of representation in an artistic way, there's a, a way of reconstructing a very, very damaged uh, situation in Mexico. So thank you. Just wanted to share some thoughts. Well, on that note, actually, sorry. Um, did anyone get to the movie Helly as the best this year? Helly? Helly, yeah, it won the best record. And that's actually exactly about what you're talking about. You describe kind of a scene where um, the individuals are on the road and the sign. That seems in the film, actually, so it must be inspired by the events. I would recommend checking it out. Good. Okay. Um, so what is, I mean, yes, so I mean, one of the things I was sort of doing was sort of throwing out more from my own sake than for anyone else, I think, possible ways of proceeding. So that's, I guess that's what the death drive, you know, sort of threw it out and it's something to come back to or, 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 or not, or smooth space, some sort of thing. Um, And the, the yeah the kind of language that, that, that you're using uh, there, I, I suppose the anxiety. I'm not sure if that's the term I use, right? But the uncertainty, perhaps, or or, or, or something. Uh, it, it's not. Uh, it, it is yeah. It is, it is as I was saying at the beginning. Uh, sort of, you know, how do we how do we think about this? You know, sort of to rethink and, and what tools are available to us. Which, what tools don't work and what, what tools uh, do. But I think mean, I'd like to believe in, I, I think I believe more in habit than I do in art. I like art well enough, but um, I, I think I, 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 I that, that's why I sort of, you know, that's my sort of nose at the end. It's, it's like what you were suggesting about people, people doing something anyway, right? The, 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 the continuation or the permanency of the sort of everydayness. Um, Yes, I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, it, it, it's worth thinking further about uh, the thing about this sort of strange, yeah, these strange sort of excessive quasi aesthetic moments in this sort of arrangement of body parts and so on, which, which make, I, which I think helps make us reconsider any, any, certainly any quick. I don't think you were suggesting anything quick, but we would make the three zero any sort of quick suggestions about like, the therapeutic value of the aesthetic or something. Because we see us in appropriation in this perverse, horrific way perhaps, of uh, uh, something that is quite something that is really. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to organize my, my thoughts, but uh, Me too. you mentioned that, yeah. <laughs> A very interesting word to describe the drug cartel as entrepreneurial, in the sense that they are using the existing framework, subverting legal infrastructure that may not be there to support the people there. Um, my question, I guess, is how far do you see this kind of system that they've developed kind of spreading, if possible, um, in such that is it possible to even subvert them and to legalize the things that they that they um, they are able to um, do what they do, such you know, through the methods of capital accumulation, free market trade, commodifying these drugs, and trading them on the free market. Is it possible to maybe, you know, just try to search for a solution? Well, I mean, you know, that's the back and back to the question of, of, of legalization. Uh, as to what will happen, I, I don't know, and I suspect that there'll be a sort of point of exhaustion, right? I suspect that's actually what will happen. But, but that's no solution, right? Right. It's just that it's interesting that you mentioned them as entrepreneurial, which I find right. very fascinating. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, these are, you know, many of them, I mean, if you sort of read up and describe and so on, you know, uh, they're smart, ruthless uh, people. They're, they are, they're the image of, I, I don't know who the, 
Right, maybe. Or, you know, the, the image of the heroic capitalist that was so praised by people like Thatcher and so on, you know? Improving people like, oh, I don't know, Alan Sugar or Richard Branson and so on. But it's the same kind of narratives that you get, right? They didn't need schooling and so on, but they, you know, got on and, and went in a scrolling number of years, they showed their leadership skills and so on. But that's how it just was mirroring, right? Just like the first mirroring of, um, of ideologies of. Uh, well, this speaking to what extent we have said about Mexico, we also said about Colombia, and what makes it different and why. Sorry? Broadly speaking, what you have said about Mexico, how could it basically, could it also be said the same about Colombia, and why, in what ways it differs, and why? I think you should tell me that, Paul. I think you're much more qualified than me. Probably. <laughs> I mean, uh, in, in some ways, uh, um, I mean, in, also in, in some ways, in, in, the, in the broad, well, this is the broadest history, right, of uh, this is global violence that I was trying to outline in the, in the very beginning. Um, uh, then in the, in the centrality, for a, a period at least of, uh, of specifically privileged violence in the 1980s, which, however, although of course things are complicated there by uh, the long running FARC insurgency, right, and the presence of the parliamentaries, um, which is not to say that we guerrilla movements do not have anything about tenacity or, 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 or impact uh, in, in Mexico, um, but there was a whole guerrilla series of uh, guerrilla campaigns which have been in the 1970s, uh, which were largely largely been to go. Uh, but the fact is a different kettle of fish altogether, it, it seems to me. Um, I mean, so yeah, yes, so, uh, no, I mean, I guess uh, in, in Colombia, um, I mean, in Colombia now we've got the whole, yeah, again, we, we've, got, we've, we've got to sort of disentangle the fact and, and the powers and the, and the, and the narcos, we're, we're in one of the endless moments of peace accords and peace, so on. But again, you, you, you tell me. I think yes and no is a short answer. I would say, probably speaking, there are parallels in the, the state of reception and the ways in which it differs. I thought you have a different perspective on the situation. I wonder, this is on the fly, but I wonder if I could try and ask a question that expands on that or, or takes that forward slightly. Um, I've been thinking about kind of the value, whether it's from an entrepreneurial perspective or from the perspective of uh, the like symbolic perspective of the levers of power or, um, or whatever, of just the value of the infrastructure of the state. And thinking about Colombia, where, as you mentioned, there have been major long-running insurgencies as opposed to Mexico where that has not been in the same way the case. And then uh, thinking about some other, <laughs> some other countries where there has have been, um, uh, been long-running instability, for example, in, uh, in Central Africa where the, the leaders of the state have been open to take over um, by oppositional political forces. Mexico, of course, historically, is, it's a much larger country. It's been a much wealthier and much more, uh, historically, had a much stronger, more stable state. There are a lot of differences, but I'm wondering whether it's plausible if we are looking forward into this red and tooth and claw kind of uh, future. What's, what's the role of, of a weakening state in that, and how does that compare? To, to a situation like Colombia, or to a situation like, say, uh, Rwanda or Congo or some of these other countries where the state has been very much appropriate. Uh, I can't really, I don't feel like I can speak with any uh, great comfort about Central Africa. Mm -hmm. um, the, the history of the state of Mexico, as I was still trying to suggest, is central to the story here. Um, for a long time, it seemed to be powerful, and then I used to call it you know, mm -hmm. rather uh, short time, revealing 
sort of weakness. Uh, for instance, this example, there is reliance on, on that distance uh, patronage network, which could uh, enable sort of counter powers to uh, arise. Uh, and yet, the state is also possible everywhere in Mexico, right? There's this sort of permeation, uh, and including, you know, within, uh, you know, the, the, it's hard to disentangle, impossible perhaps, to, to disentangle the cartels uh, from the state. Uh, hence, all the various conspiracy theories that actually try to visit the temple of the state to support the Sinaloa cartel and its other ones, and, and so on and, and so forth. Um, uh, but it's a state, I mean, I guess it, it, it forces us perhaps, I guess the, the short answer is it forces us to perhaps think again about the state, right? And the, the, the state perhaps. Uh, <coughs> and uh, to think again about the ways in which that sort of Foucauldian, Deleuzean sort of discipline and control thing, how that actually works out in practice in a situation like this. It doesn't seem. Uh, it doesn't seem very simple at all, right? Um, yeah, and, and again, maybe that's, yeah, Colombia, Colombia in the state has been much weaker for a long time and in different ways. Um, but, but again, I mean, that, the question of, the question of, I mean, I brought it now, not just the state, it's, well, it's the state, the state institutions, and the idea of the state, right? Um, and its ability to secure an idea of the nation, which I suggested, but it was in the name of the next part of 1968, that's the question of sovereignty, uh, and there's the question of the social contract, uh, which has been, so, I, mean, that, that, I mean, that's the, that's, I guess, the commonality, right, that the, what's been, what's been under attack in Venezuela as much as in uh, Argentina as much as in Mexico, right? Has been this fiction of the social contract, uh, which never, which never was very convincing uh, in, in, in Latin America. But briefly, uh, popular leaders such as Perón managed to suggest that it was a possibility. And, and, and once that once that fell apart, that's when we got the dirty wars. That's when we got neoliberalism, the abandonment. Yeah, it's a weak 
reclaiming the notion of sovereignty in those ways. Um, I, my, my feeling is that sovereignty is an end, an end and it's a good thing too. I mean, I guess that was a notion of, that's a slightly different way of saying, but similar to saying that we, we can't sort of try and call back the state, right? Any solution to the, well, what happens with the dissolution of the state has to be post-status. So, I mean, that, I guess that's what I, that there's my sympathy with people like Hart and Henry, right? So, you know, we can't sort of return to shoring up uh, uh, what seems to be a, a bankrupt, a bankrupt form, and, and a form that was, yeah, was violently excluded from its very outset, right? Um, I know that that's not what people who are talking about food sovereignty mean, um, but it gives me the shivers a little bit to try and replay a term like that. Yeah, um, to me I find an interesting parallels between the prohibition in the U.S. that period and the, the same violence and, and trafficking that's going on currently in North America. And I'm wondering if there's any studies that you're aware of that have been done to try to compare those two in the sense of what might happen if drugs are decriminalized or at least pulled out of the black market profitability. Uh, such as the, you know, like what happened in terms of filling power vacuums, uh, you know, as you're comparing with the, the dissolution of the state of Mexico with, for example, the rise of the Kennedy dynasty uh, after Prohibition ended, to, to um, come in and take over some of that political uh, vacuum. I, I don't know if there's any lobby studies on this thing, but uh, I don't know. Again, I mean, I think it's a, yeah, I'm in favor of legalization sense that that uh, entrepreneurial aspect that comes in to take over an area that's high profitability maybe because you know, Thatcher's selling off the, the public owned assets or because of the uh, illegality of the products that are being moved the, the, that vast amount of wealth that's been accumulated and those cartels would, would be pushed into politics and, and to some extent recreate some sort of state at that point. Uh, would be. 
and um, and then of course yeah, uh, but, but also thinking about gender as well, and, and the, the way in which gender is figured, for instance, and in the sort of knuckle messages and and other the other culture of the, the cartels and knuckle cartels and so on and so forth, uh, gender and notions of masculinity and notions of femininity uh, alike. So um, I can't tell you anything about my program. The, the failure of uh, Mexican police days. Um, have, have you encountered in your research uh, any encouraging sort of uh, mobilizations of, of citizenry um, to do their own policing, as it were, to keep themselves secure as far as that's possible? So self-defense? Yeah. You can know self-defense? Um, not that I know, or I'm not, not that I know of other people may correct me. Um, it's all about correct me. Well, I, I think that what happens a lot is that uh, people that have um, wealth, they hire their right. own uh, what they spend, right? Right. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, kind of thing, right? That, uh, to, to protect their... Safety and yeah, all the security firms. Yeah. What was that? Private security firms. <laughs> but, but I think it was suggesting something more. I mean, something more or less mm -hmm. with. Oh, I mean, it's it's very it's very. Um, I don't know, I'm building as well, but but it makes it like one hour in Peru, for instance. Uh, I mean, that's one of one of the one of the ways in which the Sendero rising was put down. In the, in the quite parallel, right? What well, was the encouragement of what we call Ronda Campesinos, um, which was sort of self-defense, communal self-defense uh, groups. Um, it was kind of encouraged and facilitated from above, as well as from below. Uh, it, it, and it, it meshed as well with sort of questions of, uh, notions of uh, indigenous sociability too. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't. I don't know of anything like that in Mexico. But I actually won't be surprised. I wouldn't surprise me if there were places where something like that was in gestation. But I don't know. That uh, in the state of Michoacan, there's there are several communities that have uh, uh, learned and uh, are collectively trying to like battle against the drug cartels. And I know that there's also I've heard of a community in, in the state of Chihuahua as well. Yeah, Chiapas as well. Um, yeah, they, they kind of uh, developed their own safe uh, security. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. fine. But also, yeah, I would like to add that I think in this phenomenon it's very important that the society okay. has been. I'm sorry. So uh, I, I would like just to share that in this phenomenon that is now is experienced in Mexico. Um, uh, what is happening right now in Michoacán, so probably you're from Michoacán, Michoacán is a kind of a state that is in the Pacific side of Mexico and it's probably one of the entries of the cocaine from, from um, South America to the U.S. So right now in this state of Mexico is a big fight between the narco groups to control that area. So what is happening right now is that the, the, the society is taking part of the, this dispute. And one part of the, the society is working with the, the police and the army to figure who in the society is supporting the cartels. So what is happening is in one town, specifically the name is Patsingan. So uh, in these days, so what is happening right now is, is this conflict uh, arising because now community is really taking part of uh, who is supporting the cartels and who is supporting the guys that don't want the cartels. So and it's very unfortunate, but the thing is that happening is that uh, because the cartels, also the, the wealth and the benefit that they create, the economy that they support, there are people that are living from, from that kind of a way of life, right? So of course, if they don't have that kind of an income, 
So it's affecting the kind of uh, that community, right? So it's interesting what is going to happen. So still, so far, so it has been kind of a threatens. Uh, not many deaths so far, but uh, but I hope that uh, find a kind of a, a way to, to solve this issue without killing more people, right? So, but it's, uh, but it's interesting because society is taking part of uh, these uh, social organizations to really try to get rid of these, these practices and these guys. So they don't want to, right? And so the mobsters aren't strong arming the media in that, in that state? Yeah, all well, the things because well, they have money, so they, they have power to buy authorities, they have power to buy arms. So uh, we remember that uh, Mexico for US is the big, is 90% of the arms that are used in, the, in this war came from the US. So if you see from that perspective, it's a big market, right? So uh, cheap arms, cheap uh, ammo. So it, it's a lot of interest in around this. So, and of course, it's very uh, profitable market, right? So controlling these routes is make you a rich man. So if you, if you dare to take over these uh, routes, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, thank you. I mean, obviously, the problem is that in, in such places, however, it's very hard to make a clear distinction between people, invo people involved in uh, the drug trade in one way or another at a very low level and, and the community. So, you, the, the, the danger is this suddenly happening in Peru, for some of the wrong days, right? You get a new set of exclusions, a new set of purifications, right? Uh, which trigger and new forms of new forms of violence. That was what led to the massacre at Uchu Bagai, which is quite famous in Peru in the early 1960s. Yeah, so I am fascinated by the, the connection of two or three different directions. The first thing I was thinking a lot about late 19th century, early 20th century industrialism. And then you mentioned the industrial figures later 20th century, and the degree to which we look back at this period, at a period of massive rapacity in terms of labor conditions, that the kind of things that are done to workers, and that we work very hard to do labor movements to, to fix. But there's a sort of um, willing ignorance around that to suggest that what's happened in the Northern Hemisphere, or at least in the, the Western world around labor laws has actually fixed labor on a global scale, which of course it simply exported the problem. And as you're talking about these things, the bleeding edges. In a lot of ways, when you look at the drug trade, you know, if you compare it to the capitalism, the ultimate capitalism, this is the product that makes the, it's not a product that actually makes the, uh, the user into the person who pays and, and turns themselves into the product. And it's had an effect not only in drug producing regions, but also in drug using regions. So if you look at the, the war of drugs, so called, in, in the US and Canada, why not? It's a ridiculous amount of money that's been put into this to increase the powers of the police state at exactly the, at, at, at a, a comparable rate to which the police state has been weakened in drug producing regions. And I guess, you know, you, you said there's a point you're very happy talking to your right. And it's kind of despairing to see a, a picture of global capitalism that ebbs and flows in terms of the, who's getting shit on and who's, who's sitting on the toilet. And what you've essentially described is a, a, a region, I mean, you, you know, more broadly than focused on Mexico, that's going to exactly the same things that we've been doing for the last three or four hundred years and that the, the history of, of colonialism one of the things that your talk brought home, and I don't really have a question here, but I've been putting these thoughts together. One of the things you're talking about brought home is the degree to which colonialism has not stopped at all. And for myself, I'm drawing a lot of comparisons between that and the, the extractive industries that you also mentioned, in particular with the oil trade, oil and gas, and the degree to which our increasing demand for a product that is comparable in a way to addictive substances that we globally can't do without. 
and the degree to which that is weakening the bonds of the social contract, even in places like Canada, where you know our our, our person can float in Del Scopo and, and and use a kind of violence we're not accustomed to to protect that very thing and that level of corruption that, that we all suspect slash know about that's going on to cause wars, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess from a descriptive point of view, I come back to the question of habit that you mentioned. And I wonder, because I think we come from a similar sort of theoretical perspective, is that, and I, you know, to myself I'd say, that's where I go to as a, as a kind of solution, and yet I find myself looking at this kind of picture and really having nothing but despair. And I'm not sure that habit or art or anything can solve any of these problems when we take that three to four hundred year kind of look at it and go, we're just fucking each other worse and worse and worse as the centuries go by. And we redistribute things in the Second World War and it becomes stronger states in these particular areas, weaker states in these areas, will there be another redistribution? But I, don't know, I guess I come back to, to that question of habit. And I don't know if I want to ask you if you really believe in it. But I guess I do. Let's act as though I did, or we did. You know, I mean, that's part of what I think Kim was saying. Um, rather than put it down, you know, you got to sometimes assume the strategic repression was not. Uh, you know, that was, that's like the whole optimism of the intellect or whatever it is, you know, essence of the intellect. There's been a couple of times, and this ties back into a couple of different comments and questions, um, that uh, at certain points, things that you've identified seem like they could account for what's going on in Mexico, and then other times it seems to be like a strange picture between accounting for and could be blamed upon. And I'm wondering that in terms of Mexico itself, like uh, who or what is blame being located? Like where, where are people within Mexico like in Maybe some of the other people here as well can speak to this. Is like what is being blamed? I mean, we said that you know um, neoliberalism and capitalism can account for the situation, but is that what is being blamed, or is it the the starving for or the desire for drugs in North America? Is that what is being blamed, or is it uh, you know, um, entrepreneurship that's being blamed, or the lack of other economic opportunities that is being blamed? So like, you know, what is what is the blame rather than the this can account for? Uh, well, I just said a little bit, but also answer this. Um, I think there are a variety of different discourses which are used in different, you know, like political, you know, media, mm -hmm. you know, programs, for instance. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, some delinquency, <coughs> so on and so forth. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't think. There's a general, there's a, there's a general, um, I, don't, I don't think, I, I don't think the finger is put on capital or neoliberalism particularly. I think there's a, a general consensus in, in the media, at least, right? Uh, and also in the political class uh, uh, to, to speak otherwise. Um, but I, I, I also think that more generally, the attitude is often just hard. Right? You know, I mean, the, the, you know, one has to produce discourse of some sort or other, but there are ways in which, um, yeah, the, kind, the, the kinds of images, the kinds of news that you get, I mean, this is sort of a dead name, right? When every day, I mean, today I noticed one of the, some in I forget exactly what the details, the details again are sort of blurred, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a sort of situation, right? You go about your business anyway. Um, but there is, yeah, there's a certain horror, especially when something happens which is particularly close to home. Mm -hmm. And there was an incident in Mexico City itself. Mexico City itself is generally not being touched. But there was, um, uh, it's basically, 
with young people and uh, so the last time of disco uh, a year or so ago. And uh, I, I, I think, again, I have a reason to give up to say, um, the part of it is just horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a big tradition of um, blaming the the government, right? Mm -hmm. Like in a very psychoanalytically hysteric discourse, right? Like it's it's always the pre, the pre, the pre, and then everybody voted again for them, right? Oh, not everybody, but a lot of people, and then the fraud and stuff. But I, I would say that um, I agree with you, John, in the sense that um, the silence is is a little bit scary. Because I remember a few years back, uh, people uh, kind of uh, complain more openly. Nowadays, it's a silence, right? Like it's just like if you ask how things are going, just people don't want to talk about that, which is worrisome even more no? than than. And I, I agree with you in terms of the horror, right? Like there's no words almost for addressing that. Okay, uh, shall we uh, reconvene at the uh, Metropole Pub, 355 Adams?